So I don't know if you were here with us last week, but I gave a message um, based on the first part of Ephesians 5 where Paul has this really interesting phrase right around verse 10. He says, uh, find out what pleases the Lord. And remember last week we talked about how love finds creative ways to show itself. And we, and we looked at some examples from the Bible of men and women who were in love with God. And so they, they showed that love in out-of-the-box ways. Remember Abraham planted a tree and that was his act of worship. David, he was an artist and poetry and songs was an act of worship. Or Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus and she broke a box as her way of showing love. So we talked about how love does that, but then also how sometimes expressions of love don't always come across the right way, or maybe we show our love in ways that are confusing. Remember we talked about epic Valentine Day fails, and I showed you a few pictures of, some, of what not to do on Valentine's Day. Well, Last week, one of those we talked about was bacon roses. Remember that? If you weren't here, you're really confused right now. Uh, Listen to the podcast, but we talked about bacon roses. And I just have to share this with you. So after the noon gathering, so a week ago today, this young couple came up to me, super sweet, super nice young couple. And they introduced themselves. I get to know them, talk to them. And then they start sharing with me. And he's like, you know, uh, because they're they're dating. And she's like, um, you, you know what my girlfriend wanted more than anything else, he told me. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, engagement ring, honeymoon in Maui. And she said, no, wh- what I really wanted uh, was bacon roses. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I, just, I just made fun of them. Really? And she's like, yeah, actually, I really wanted that. So true story, <laughs> he goes home and makes her bacon roses, makes her bacon roses, brings them to her. He showed me a picture of the bacon roses that he had made for her. And she's looking at me like, it was a dream come true. It was like the happiest day of my life. So shortly after that, he proposed and she said yes, and they're about to get married. So so Westside family, I stand corrected. I just, I (laughs) repent of that. And it turns out that a key to a woman's heart, guys, take note, a key to a woman's heart is in fact bacon roses. You want her to say yes, bacon roses. And, or in, or in uh, Portland, perhaps it's tofu roses. I don't know. Um, so, and because we're doing marriage next week, I just think that's important to know. That has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about today. So we better get started. Verse 15, let's dive in. Be very careful, Paul writes, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. And some translations say redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus. Paul begins by saying, make the most of every opportunity. Let's just say that together. Here we go. Make the most of every opportunity. In the Greek language, that phrase is actually two words. The first is exagorosomai, and it means to redeem something or to buy something back. And the second word is kairos, which is the Greek word for time. So Paul is saying, literally, that we need to buy up, buy up every opportunity, or he's saying that time is like currency. Now, it's fascinating when you think of time in that way. Every single day, you are given a set amount of time. You're you're given currency. You're given 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, 18 80,400 seconds. God has given you the gift of time to either waste or you can redeem it. You can buy it. You can take advantage of it. You can invest it. And when you think about it, yesterday's currency is gone. 
We can't change what happened yesterday. Tomorrow's currency, well, it's not guaranteed us. We don't know if we're gonna have tomorrow. We don't know what's gonna happen today. The only time that we have is the time that we have right now. And even this moment is passing really quickly. Another way of looking at it is, imagine if your entire life were compressed into a single day. So all of you, your whole life, birth to death, is one day. And let's say that you were born at 7 a.m. and that you're gonna die at midnight. Well, if you're 15 years old this afternoon, it is now 10.25 in the a.m. in the story of your life. If you're 25, uh, you're, it's 12.42, so just past, past lunchtime. If you're 35, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. If you're 45 years old, it is 5.16 p.m., so time's running out. And if you're 55, you may as well call it a day. It's over. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I got in so much trouble for that for, at the ADM gathering. But the point is, like, life, life is just passing us quickly. Life is short. And that is why the Bible over and over again says, buy it up, use it, redeem it. Don't waste it. David put it this way in the book of Psalms, chapter 90. He says, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet, <laughs> yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. Welcome to church. Thank you, David, for that. <laughs> for they quickly pass and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Notice, David says, teach us to number our days. We think in terms of years. We think, well, I've got another 20 years left or 40 years left or whatever. That may or may not be true. The Bible actually says the wise person is thinking in terms of days. Okay, teach me to number my days. I'm not gonna take advantage of assuming that I have X amount of time left in my life. I may or I may not. So teach me to number the days, the moments that I have. Now, James chapter four uh, talks about the same thing. Listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there. We'll carry on business, make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. James says, your life, it's a vapor. It's a mist. It's here one moment and it's gone the next. When, when you strike a match and you blow the match out, there is a wisp of smoke that you see for what, a couple of seconds? The Bible says that's your life, that's it. You, you're born, you live, and then it's over. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says, don't squander one bit of this marvelous life that God has given us. Benjamin Franklin, he said, do you love life? Then do not waste time. <laughs> For that is the stuff that life is made of. Life is a gift. Time is sacred. It's holy ground. In fact, the fact that you're here today, that we're in church, that you're you, that you have your story and your background, that you exist on earth, that you have breath in your lungs and a heart that's beating in your chest. That fact alone is actually a mathematical miracle. It is highly improbable that we exist at all. Now, I, I personally love TED Talks, and um, I was watching one the other day, really, really fascinating talk, and it was, the guy was talking about the improbability of life mathematically and our own existence individually, actually we shouldn't be here when you look at statistics. And, and he went through and he began to add up all the math and, and he said, okay, the mathematical probability of your parents meeting, and he went through the numbers there, really highly improbable. And the probability of their parents meeting and their parents meeting and their parents meeting. And then he said, the probability of that one sperm Meeting your mother's egg, it's so unlikely. It, it's, you are literally a miracle. The fact that you're here, your story, your parents, for better or for worse, it's a miracle. And, and he gave a number to it. He said it's one chance, one in 400 trillion. That's literally, mathematically, 
impossible. One in 400 trillion. That's the same chance as that country music will be in heaven. Some things you just know <laughs> isn't, isn't going to happen right now. You know what's so funny about this is that our... At our 10 a.m. gathering, I always get in trouble for stuff, uh, always. And at our 10 a.m., there's like this really famous DJ. He's a country music DJ known in the city. He's been doing it for 40 years. Amazing guy. He knows Carrie Underwood, like all these people, super famous guy. He comes to Westside. I didn't know that. And he was at the 10. And it was classic. We had this amazing, he, he thought it was hilarious. But you are literally a miracle. Your life is a miracle. Sometimes the enemy attacks us like, okay, you shouldn't even be here and your life is pointless and there is no purpose and we start to feel discouraged. No, God has created you in such a way to be you. He's given you your story, your parents, your background. He's placed you in this time, 2017, and it's for a purpose. He's given you the sacred gift of life, of time. And Paul is saying, don't let it slip away. Redeem it. Buy it back. And what I love about Paul is he didn't just talk about this stuff. He did it. I mean, talk about redeeming the time. Read the book of Acts. Every moment was in pursuit of the dream that God had given him. You, you look at the book of Ephesians. When Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, he was in prison. Now, thinking about this, like if I were in prison, he's waiting for his death sentence. He would die at the hands of a crazy Nero He's waiting for that, but instead of like, feeling sorry for himself, I would do that. I'd be like Eeyore in chains, right? Listening to Alice in chains. Like I would be so down, wasting my time, Netflix, whatever, Breaking Bad. That would be me, but Paul's like, no. You know, I'm in, the, I'm in chains, sure. And I'm going through hardship, sure. But I wanna redeem the time. And I want to use it. He started praying for the churches. He started sharing the gospel to other prisoners and uh, uh, soldiers who began to get saved. Paul used the time to write books of the Bible. We literally would not have the book of Ephesians had Paul not been redeeming the time. You're holding in your hands what can happen when someone chooses to buy every opportunity that is given to them. So I wanna, I wanna kinda delve into this as deep as we can in, in the next 20 minutes. And I wanna talk through, okay, what does that mean in our life, practically? How can we take this powerful concept of buy every opportunity, and how does this interact with my Monday mornings? What does this mean for this dating relationship? How, how does this affect my work tomorrow? And how, how will this begin to alter my trajectory? So I wanna share a few thoughts with you before we go. And the first is this, and it just jumps off the page. Like, if we're to redeem the time, number one, we have to have a plan. Paul prefaces the whole a section here by saying, be very careful, look at verse 15, be very careful in how you live. And this word careful, it's such an intriguing word. It's the word vlepo in the Greek. I know you're like, well, it has a B. In the Greek, B is pronounced V. It's the word vlepo. Vlepo means have vision. Weigh carefully. Live with purpose. Vlepo was used to describe a group of travelers. And they're on a long journey and they see up ahead there's a mountain range, and they have to figure out how to get over those mountains. Vlepo means, instead of just blindly going forward, not knowing what, it will, what will happen, vlepo is, no, let's stop, let's take some time, hours or days or weeks if we have to, and let's map it out. Let's begin to figure out how we're gonna get forward. Let's write these things down. That's the word that Paul uses. He says, be careful how you live. So have a plan which will enable you to redeem the time. Now, uh, the wisest man, aside from Jesus, who ever lived, Solomon in the Old Testament, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right because there is a time and there is a way for everything. Jesus in the New Testament, he said, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. 
won't you first sit down and estimate the cost if you have enough money to complete it? So Jesus says, okay, you wanna build something new. I want, I want that new degree program. I wanna get involved in that new relationship. I want that new career path. I wanna buy a new house, whatever the case may be. Before you do something new, Jesus says, if you're wise, you're gonna sit down, you're gonna estimate the cost. You're gonna ask the hard questions. Does dating him get me to where I wanna be someday? <laughs> no? Well, say no, move on. Does taking that job opportunity, is that part of the long range vision for my life? If not, do something else. You ask the hard questions, is this sustainable? Will this contribute to what God has shown me? You see, when we plan, we're bringing the future into the present. When we plan, we're preparing ourselves today to be more effective tomorrow. Abraham Lincoln, this is one of my favorite quotes. He says, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. Oh my gosh, that is so true. That is so true. The wisest investment of your time that you can make is to take time, be it months or even years, a season of your life where you say, instead of just jumping into this marriage, instead of just jumping into that job, instead of just jumping into this vision, I wanna take a season of my life and I wanna sharpen the ax. I, I wanna work on being the right person. I wanna be the kind of guy, that, the kind of woman I wanna date wants to date me. <laughs> I wanna develop character in my soul. I wanna draw close to God. Take a season of your life to sharpen the ax. And I tell you what, in my own life, this is something I'm continually learning and it's something I have to do. Because if I'm not sharpening the ax, I won't have anything to give. In our church, and we, we all have busy schedules and it's true of my life for sure. There's so many moving parts to this church and decisions that we have to make and people to meet with and crisis to try and avoid and all kinds of stuff. And what happens in my life in the role that I'm in is that if I don't vlepo it, if I don't, if I don't take time to sit down and, and seek God's heart and, and map out a way forward, what happens in my life, and I know some of you can relate to this, is it happens slowly where my mind just won't stop uh, there's thoughts that just keep intruding. My mind is it, just circling around and around. My, my heart begins to feel overwhelmed. Uh, maybe I get anxious. Um, maybe I don't sleep very well at night. And at first I'm like, well, what's going on? Well, many, many times it's because I haven't taken the time to actually hit the pause button and, and seek God and get counsel and get a whiteboard and start to plan and write things out. So what I've done in my schedule is every few months I'll get away for a day and that whole day is just map out a plan. Okay, there's the mountains, there's, there's where I wanna go, but I need to figure out a way to get there. And something beautiful happens when I do that. When I don't, it's a disaster. It, it really is. I just get grumpy and I'm on edge and start chain smoking. That's another story. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, right? But when you make a plan, there's freedom. When you make a plan, you can see further than you ever did before. When you make a plan, that there's, there's peace. In life, we can either be reactionary or revolutionary. What's a reactionary? A reactionary is someone who simply responds to the moment because they really don't know where they're going. So something happens or there's some opportunity that's in front of them. Oh, sure, I'll do that. Some invitation, sure, I'll go there. Sure, I'll date that person. But they don't really have a sense, first of all, of identity, who they are in Jesus. And secondly, they don't have that sense of purpose where they wanna go. A reactionary simply responds to things that are thrown your way. A revolutionary, though, is someone who sees the mountain rage, who knows how to get there, who have a deep sense of identity and purpose and mission in life, so that when those invitations or opportunities or crises come, and they will, you know how to navigate them because you have a much broader sense of what the future looks like. Um, I think one of the most brilliant authors of all time is Victor Hugo. He wrote Les Miserables, Hunchback of Notre Dame, brilliant thinker. And he has this quote, and I think it's so true. He said, he who plans and follows out that plan carries a thread that will guide him through the maze of the most busy life. 
But where no plan is laid, where the disposal of time is surrendered merely to the chance of incidents, oh, this line, chaos will soon reign. I mean, how many of us are in a place where, ah, it's chaos? What would it look like to say, Vlepo, I'm gonna take some time, pray, get counsel, get the whiteboard, and plan. Be careful, he says, how you live. Number two, number two, we need to eliminate distraction. If we're gonna redeem the time, we have to master the art of saying no to things. Notice that Paul says, look back at verse 15, redeem the time. Why, Paul? Why should we do this? He says, because the days are evil, which implies that there is a lot that is warring against our time, right? There's so much that is pulling at the precious gift of time that God has given us. World Health Organization this last week, maybe you saw it. They put out a whole study where they said, it is now estimated by 2030 that the average global age that people will live to, in, in, in most countries, actually America wasn't quite in that 90 realm, but they said average human age will be right around 90, right around 90. So we're living longer, they said, than ever before. But here's the catch. <laughs> we're living longer than ever before, but we are also more distracted than ever before. There's no other point in human history where there's been so much pulling at our time. Matthew Crawford, he, he calls it, he says, it's an age of distractions, social media, TV, video games, iPhones. Um, ABC News had an article recently. They did a whole study on this, and they said the, the average amount of time that we look at our smartphones is 150 times per day. 150 times per day. This is Americans looking at their iPhone. And then they said, that is on average three, over three hours of staring at our phone every day, which when you do the math, three times seven, that's almost an entire day per week that we're just doing this. And, and what's happening, scientists say, and we're just on the beginning of this, so we're trying to figure out what technology is doing to our mind, but the University of Kent, they had a fascinating study too, this is in England, and they said, that when we're on social media, they looked at social media specifically, they said our brain actually experiences a distortion of time. <laughs> so neurologically, your brain kind of gives you a false impression of how much time has passed. Now, have you ever found this out? You're on Instagram or whatever, and you think it's been 20 minutes, and it turns out, oh, an hour, hour and a half, what's going on? And the University of Kent is saying, well, actually, there is a very neurological reason for that. We're easily distracted, and because we're easily distracted, scientists say we're losing cognitive function, that our minds actually don't work the way that they used to. We're losing an ability for sustained linear thinking. Um, our attention span, I mentioned this a month ago or so, our attention span is, is shrunk now. Used to be 12 seconds back in 2000. They say now it's about eight seconds, eight seconds, for reference, a goldfish, its average attention span is nine seconds. <laughs> so we make Dory look like an absolute genius, right? And this is the age in which we live. We're easily distracted. And, it, and it's not just, I'm not just you know, hitting on iPhone, social media, Netflix, whatever. I think if Paul were writing in 2017, he had actually put that stuff here in the Bible because that's our story. But then in verse 18, he does talk about something that we absolutely can relate to. Um, he says in verse 18, in the context of redeeming the time, he says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Now, we could give a whole talk on this, but notice, first of all, Paul does not say don't drink wine, right? He says don't get drunk on wine. Why would, why would Paul say that? Because by definition, getting drunk is a waste of time, right? If we're talking about redeeming the time, well, getting drunk is not exactly a profitable way to redeem that time. He uses the word debauchery, which we don't use that word so often, but uh, when you think about it, it's kind of a this super evocative word, debauchery. I mean, what are you doing this afternoon? Oh, I'm going home, I'm gonna hang out, have dinner, and then I'm gonna participate in some debauchery. It just sounds like, whoa, okay, that's great. 
And it kind of is what it sounds like. Debauchery is a Greek word that simply means to waste your life. Just write that down. It's where we get the word, by the way. Oh, I got so wasted last night, right? It's this Greek concept. Okay, I'm wasting my life. I've been given this opportunity. Instead of using it for something good, I'm throwing it away. Now, this is a huge issue. It's a huge issue in our city. It's a huge issue. Forbes magazine recently for millennials. Maybe this has been part of your story. Um, I know in my life, I came from a home where uh, my dad was an alcoholic. So I wasn't born in a Christian home. Uh, grew up in England. When I was eight, we moved to Southern California. And I saw firsthand what alcoholism can do. I, I saw how alcohol literally drove my parents apart. So my dad moved down to San Diego, and when I'm in middle school, you know, my dad wasn't around in the house. And, and I saw the destructive effects of what alcohol can do. Now, by God's grace, my parents later on got back together, and God healed them. They became followers of Jesus, and I'm so thankful for that. But I look back at, at that season of life in my childhood, and I just think, whoa, how many wasted opportunities because of alcohol? Especially having a kid now, right? How many, how many things could have been done? How many words could have been said? How many wonderful stories could be told? But alcoholism wrecked it. And that's the heart that Paul is giving to us here. He's not trying to be some legalistic guy. He's saying, you, you are a miracle, one in 400 trillion. You are an absolute miracle. Your life has purpose. God has placed you here. He's made you you. He's given you talents and abilities and resources and ideas and dreams. He's given you your story not to waste it, but rather to use it for something beautiful. Paul is saying, don't let alcohol rob you of your potential. Don't miss out on what God could do through your story. Redeem the time. And if we're to redeem the time, we have to master the art of eliminating distraction. What is that for you? Maybe for some here it is alcohol, and you just like, you know what? I, I just need to cut that out so that I can be more focused. Maybe it is some unhealthy dating relationship. You're like, that cat's gotta go, time to move on. Maybe it is some social media thing. I have a friend who literally just threw away his iPhone. He's like, you know what, I'm done with that. I need to simplify my life, and that's just keeping me from being more productive. And so he got rid of it. What do you have to say no to in order to say yes to what God has for you? In German, um, my wife and I, we learned German a few years ago, and. Uh, we lived in Vienna. I uh, used to teach uh, English uh, for Sony and Panasonic, and my, my wife was a school teacher in Vienna. And so to help us with German, we started going to the University of Vienna and learning some fascinating German phrases. And one of them, which is just so good, is vinegar aber besser. Vinegar aber besser. It means less but better. Redeeming the time is the relentless pursuit of less but better. One author calls it essentialism. Redeeming the time means investing not just in good things. There are a ton of good things you could do with your life. There are a ton of good directions that you could go in. But redeeming the time means I'm going to invest in the best thing. I'm gonna be laser focused on that. A light bulb is diffused light. It illuminates a room. A laser is focus light, and it can cut through steel. And when we have that kind of laser focus, it leads to effectiveness, which brings me to my second point. If we are to redeem the time, number three, we have to stay true to our calling. Stay true to our calling. Um, look down in verse 17. Paul writes, understand what the will of the Lord is. In other words, in an age of distraction, we have to choose to stay focused on the will of God, on where he is leading us. Paul put it this way in Philippians 3. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. 
to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus. Paul says, I have a goal. I know where I wanna go. And because of that, notice he says, I'm focused on one thing, one thing. Kierkegaard, he said, purity of heart is to will the one thing. What is your one thing? What is your call? When you know what you're called to be, you know how to redeem the time to get you to that destination. And like any goal, it starts with the small things. And I think this is the part we, we so often miss. It starts with little decisions. Um, the physicist, Lauren Whitehead, brilliant thinker. 1983, he did a whole study, and I just love that a physicist does this. He spent months of his life studying dominoes. And he wanted to just understand the mathematics and the physics behind when a domino falls and how much uh, matter a domino could displace when it falls. And so what he discovered, brilliant mind, he found out in 1983 that a domino can displace and move another domino that is up to 50% its size. Well, in 2001, a group of scientists got together and they wanted to, okay, let, let's see how this works. And they started out with a two-inch domino and the next one was 50% bigger, the next one 50% bigger and so on. They got eight of these and they, they knocked them over. They did this whole study and they found out, yes, actually this is true. Starting with two inches, by the time they got to the eighth domino, it's three feet tall. And they said, if you keep going, the 10th domino would be about the size of Peyton Manning the 23rd domino will be the size of the Eiffel Tower, and the 31st would be, this blew my mind, the 31st would be the size of Everest. So it all starts with something this big. What you do with the small things matter. God has given you a day, 24 hours, 18,400 seconds. It doesn't sound like a lot. But what you do with the small amount of time can actually set off a chain reaction in your life. It's a domino effect. You choose to do the right thing. You say yes to God in the small things, how you live, where you go online, the small decisions, the words that come out of your mouth, the two inch dominoes that no one else knows, but you know it's the right thing. You do that day after day after day, the domino effect, and it leads you to something beautiful. It takes you to where God is calling you to be. Redeem the time. It means stay true to that. Number four, and we're done. I, lo I love this last one. Um, we need to embrace the moment. Embrace the moment. You know, the Greeks, they had two words for time. We have one. The Greeks, they had two. The word chronos and kairos. Now, both of these were Greek gods. Kronos was envisioned as kind of an elderly, gray-haired god in the sky, long beard. And his name, Kronos, was used to describe the ticking of a clock. Every second that goes by, you're getting older. We get the word chronology from that, right? It's a scientific term, the passing of time. That's chronos. Notice, Paul doesn't use that scientific term, chronos. He uses a much more deep, profound word. It's the word kairos. And kairos means the opportune time, the right time. Kronos or kairos is time that you experience when you're living in the present. It's time when you're in the moment. Do you ever those times in life where you're like, oh, you're just there, 110%. All of your senses are awake. There's an awareness to your surroundings. That's kairos. Kairos is not cram as much into your life as you possibly can. I, I actually used to read this phrase, redeem the time because the days are evil. And I used to think, oh, Paul is saying we just need to be really, really busy, right? No, he's not saying that at all. He is not saying ignore everyone else around you because you have somewhere to go. No, that is not redeeming the time. Redeeming the time means 
Recognize the gift of the moment. Okay, so I'm not distracted by the past, forgetting those things that lie behind, and I'm not overly preoccupied with the future, although planning is important. Kairos means, okay, I, as much as I possibly can be, present right now, in this moment. Kairos is awakening to God's nearness in your life. Kairos is opening your eyes to the beauty that is around you. Redeeming the time is the art of learning thankfulness in every situation. And that is why Paul, notice in verse 18, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another, psalms, hymns, songs, And then notice, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Don't miss this. This is so huge. Here's a sign that you're living this way. Here's a sign that you understand kairos, thankfulness. Have you noticed that when you're thankful, when you you just take a, a minute or two and just verbally, you begin to articulate gratitude, for the things that are in your life. Have you noticed that when you're thankful, time slows down? When you're thankful, you suddenly see things, whoa, that you hadn't seen before. When you're thankful, you recognize the fingerprints of God are all over your life. I love poetry. There's an 18th century Victorian poet, brilliant woman, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She said, earth is crammed with heaven. Every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. Redeeming the time is the art of taking off your shoes. It means that you're seeing every opportunity as an opportunity for worship. It means the recognition that even the mundane things of life are infused with the presence of God. Moses stood before the burning bush and he couldn't understand, why is this bush burning? But it's not being destroyed, this is odd. He walks up to the burning bush and God speaks to him and says, Moses, take off your sandals because the place where you stand is holy ground. Who are you? I am, I am, talk about Kairos. I, not I will be, not I was, I am the present. It's the present, it's now. And Moses took off his sandals. Kairos is the art of taking off your sandals and sinking your toes into the presence of God. It means, God, you're here, and it's just a bush that's on fire, but you're in that bush. God, you're here, and I may not understand what's happening in that situation, but it's infused with your presence. God, I'm at work, but there's a burning bush all around me. I'm at school, and your voice is right next to me. I'm stuck in traffic on 217, and yet I am is there. Show of hands, how many of you have heard of Brother Lawrence? Anyone? Okay, a few of you have. Okay, I need to introduce you to him. Not personally, because he's dead. That would be weird. Um, but he wrote this amazing book, which you've got to pick up. Just pick it up. I think we still have copies at the book table. If not, go online. Um, it's called The Practice of the Presence of God. Have you heard of that? The Practice of the Presence of God. You can read it easy in an hour. Brother Lawrence was a 16th century monk And his job, living in a monastery, every monk was given a different task. Brother Lawrence's task was to wash dishes for his entire life. For most of us, it sounds like a nightmare. He's hours in the kitchen, 10, 12 hours a day, washing dishes, washing dishes, occasionally cooking for the other monks, washing dishes. Brother Lawrence, early on, made a conscious decision. He said, you know what? Maybe I don't like this job, but I'm gonna redeem the time. I'm gonna use this opportunity to draw close to God. And you know what Brother Lawrence said? It's so beautiful. He said, during this, this time, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna worship. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna sing. He, he would literally be singing out loud. He'd be writing songs. He'd be talking to God. He'd be praying. As the years went by, his prayers were so beautiful and riveting and profound and spirit-filled that people came 
from hundreds of miles away. Word got out. Did you hear about that monk who washes dishes? Yes, his prayers are amazing. We need to go see him. And they show up at the monastery just to listen to him pray. Every common bush is a fire with God. And in that book, if you read it, he has this great line. He says, it is not necessary to have great things to do. <laughs> I turn my little omelet in the pan for the love of God. Isn't that awesome? And when it is finished, if I have nothing else to do, I adore my God. Kairos means something as simple as an omelet, washing dishes, standing in line at Costco, talking to your roommates, Something as simple as the ordinary things of life are an opportunity to encounter the living God. Redeeming the time, I promise you, redeeming the time will turn boredom into beauty. It will turn monotony into music. Someone showed me this video the other day and I just, I love it. It's kind of funny, this guy living in the South and it's kind of like the Brother Lawrence of the South or something, he, this, his washing machine, you know how sometimes they'll like, rattle around and thump and make, make no noises and all that. So this guy, well, I'll, I'll just show you the video. Check this out. Hey, hey, you get down the fiddle and you get down the bowl. <laughs> Kick off the shoes and you throw them on the floor. Dance in the kitchen to the morning line to Louisiana Saturday night. That has to be the best video of all time. And that's why we left North Carolina. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's living in the Kairos moment, right? Kairos is saying, okay, there's something mundane, let's make some music. There's something boring, let's turn it into something beautiful. Could that be what Paul had in mind when he wrote here in Ephesians 5, redeem the time, sing. Make music, make melody in your heart to the Lord. All around us, all around us, are opportunities to take off our sandals and worship him. Your life is so beautiful and it's so sacred and the enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to rob your time. He wants to snatch the preciousness of life from you. I talked to a lady, I talked to several people today, but one at the 8 a.m. just really hit me. Um, she, she was sharing with me how this verse has changed her life the last couple years. She said, Dom, for 40 years, I, I just had this mentality of, of discouragement, constantly discouraged. Every day I'd wake up feeling down. I was always looking on things that were bad in life. And she said, that was just my attitude. And I realized one day as I read Ephesians 5, redeem the time, sing, and, and make melody, be thankful in all things. She said, that changed me a couple years ago. And she said, now every day, and it's a simple discipline, every day I get up, the first thing I do is I just start to thank God for the day. No matter how I'm feeling, no matter how much sleep I got, no matter what's going on in that day, I, the first thing I wanna say, the first thing I wanna do in that day is give thanks to God. That is what it means to take off your sandals and be in the presence of God. And that is how you can redeem the time. So I, I just wanna ask you today, and this is the question God's been speaking in my heart all week, and it's this, how will you use the gift of today? God's given you today. I don't know about tomorrow, maybe we'll have it, maybe we won't, I don't know about this week, who knows what's ahead of us, but he's given you now. He's given you this chance, we're, we're in church, we're about to sing and worship. How are you gonna use that? Will we stand aloof? Will we be distracted thinking about the past or the future too much and, and missing out on what God wants to do? What if God wants to speak to you before this gathering's over? What if there's a bush that's on fire and he's saying, take off your sandals? What if there's something he wants to put on your heart about the future? This can be our moment. This can be our opportunity. And what do you have to eliminate to get to a place where you are focused on what God has called you to be right now? What do you have to say no to? What are the distractions that you need to cut out of your life? Whatever it is, don't let it hold you back from what God has for you. Amen. And there is so much that he has for you. 
His plans are, are for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And when we open our eyes to that reality, and we just say, okay, the bush is burning, I'm here, sandals are off, God speak, what we find is something as simple as time becomes a doorway into eternity. Would you all stand up with me? Hey, let's pray. God, we want to pause right now and just acknowledge your presence. The bush is burning. Your spirit is here. Forgive me, God. I, uh, I read this and I'm just so convicted because I am the worst at doing this. I get so distracted and... God, help me to be more present. <sighs> Slow our minds down, Lord. Lift off the burdens of our life and we just take this moment right now and just breathe deeply. You're here. You're with us. Teach us to number our days. And we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you. May we not waste it. May we not squander it on stupid, meaningless things. And you said in your word, one way we can be in the moment. You said, sing, <laughs> make melody in your heart, be filled with the spirit, worship, be thankful. That's why we do this. That's why week after week we come to this place because we need this holy ground. We need an opportunity to just put our eyes on you, Lord. As we worship you, I pray it will come from the heart. I pray this will be the most gather, passionate gathering of the day so far that our eyes will be on you, the hands will be raised, the voices would just be lifted, that we'd sing with all our heart, that we'd be present, that we'd be present with you, the I am. Love you so much, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, before we sing, I have one last thought I want to share with you, and it's been on my heart heavy all day. I know in a message like this, that it is so easy for some of us to feel kind of discouraged, honestly, because Paul is saying, redeem the time, redeem the time, take advantage of your life. And, and we look at our story, you, you maybe look at your story, the last five years, 20 years, 40 years, whatever the case may be. And you look back at your past and you're like, oh, I wish I heard this message 20 years ago. I, I wish I hadn't wasted my time pursuing that dating relationship. It was so dumb. I wish I didn't get caught up in that addiction. The chains just suffocated me for all those years. I, I wish I hadn't pursued that when that wasn't God's plan or purpose for me. I mean, how many of us, how many of us today were like, ah, we, we, we have this sense of the brevity of life. It's, it's the match that's just wisping away. And, and we're like, why did I waste my time doing things that don't matter. And so we hear this and we can feel discouraged. But you need to know this. You need to know this. You're here. Your heart is still pounding in your chest. You have breath in your lungs. God has a purpose for you still. And if you're not dead, God's not done. <laughs> and there is something he wants to do in you and through you and the enemy wants to discourage you and say, well, you've done this year after year, you've wasted so much time, you may as well continue on that, down that path. And God says, no, no, you can take off your sandals right now. Moses was 80 when he heard that. You can sink your toes into holiness right now. There is something God wants to do in you and through you. The enemy wants to rip you off. But God says this moment can be the moment where your life changes. 
and it might be a huge drastic decision. It might be something tiny, the two inch domino that sets off a chain reaction in your life.